Hello and welcome to my wheel explainer. Today I'm going to give you a rundown of sizes, standards and technologies. So without further ado, let's get into it. The most common sizes are 26 inch, 27.5 inch, which is often called 650B and 29 inch. This is a breeding ground for disgruntlement, but is it really that complex? Well, not really, but be prepared. I'm about to throw some numbers at you. I'm going to talk about hub standards that use through axles. For the rear, there is 142 millimeters. There is 148 boost and there is super boost, which is 157. All of these variants use axles that are 12 millimeters in diameter. It's not just that the end caps move further apart, but also the flanges of the hubs. So proponents of this system say that by having the spokes join the hubs at a further distance apart will theoretically help to build a stronger wheel. But there can be drawbacks such as heel clearance, especially on super wide rear ends on super short chain states. As you can imagine, there can be just no room for your foot to go. Now, when changing the spacing of your flanges, the consequence is that the brake rotor sits further out. And this is where the incompatibility comes from when you're going between different standards. Both the 142 and the 148 millimeter spacing have quick release options in the same brake spacing, which is where 135 and 141 come respectively. Now for front wheels, 15 by 100 mil was once the prevailing standard, but now it's 15 by 110 mil, which is the boost. There is also 20 by 110 mil and 20 by 110 mil boost, which is the really confusing one. How can there be two different standards for the same width? The 20 by 110 mil boost just changes where the brake rotor sits. It moves it out to maximize the space between the hub flanges. It's also the easiest standard to remedy with just a basic washer kit and some longer bolts. Now, axles haven't always been this big. They used to work quite happily with simple quick release levers. Now, quick release levers still work and are commonplace on less aggressive bikes, but bigger axles were a response to bikes being used on more extreme terrain. There are three main ones. There's the more traditional type, which was cross compatible with almost any cassette. The issue with this free hub model surfaced when we wanted to run a larger range in our cassettes. The smallest cog and therefore the largest gear was limited by the diameter of the free hub itself to an 11 tooth. When SRAM released their XD free hub body, it enabled a 10 tooth. Now, what this meant is you could run a smaller chainring without losing as much top end speed. This would in turn make it easier to climb steep terrain. So it really opened up a lot of knock on consequences in frame design. It's pretty impressive. The third variant is Shimano's Microspleen and is their remedy to a similar problem, but it's more of a recent release, so it isn't so common. What does free hub engagement mean? Well, if I had 10 points of engagement, then there would be 10 chances for the free hub to engage per rotation. Each ratchet would engage at 36 degrees apart. Now, if you had 20 point engagement, then each would be 18 degrees apart. This is how much the cranks can rotate before meeting and engaging those teeth to drive them forward. The higher the number of engagement, means the closer to being instantaneous it is. So if you want something to be snappy out of the gate or in turns, you'd be surprised at how much difference this can make. Not all bikes like to have that instant feeling engagement though. Sometimes high amounts of engagement points, well, don't necessarily pair very nicely with certain suspension systems. The mechanism itself varies between ratchets and pulls on the hub or simple star ratchets that combine with one another. Spokes are a whole topic in themselves, so I'm going to try and keep it snappy. Now, spokes come in a variety of lacing patterns such as radial, two cross, and three cross. Now, 
things can come symmetrically or asymmetrically. And spokes are commonly available in J-Bend, which is where it is hooked at the end, or straight pull, which is where it goes straight through the hub. But some will have a specific spoke to the model of hub and rim that the wheel is using. Now, more and more manufacturers offer what I would term a wheel system that includes rim, spokes, and hubs that are all designed to integrate with one another. Now, this does mean that sometimes cross compatibility is harder and sourcing parts locally can be a bit more difficult, but they definitely do have their benefits. Now, some brands will even send out spare spokes such as Mavic do when you're buying a new wheel just to cover you for such an eventuality. Traditionally, more spokes would be spec'd for a stronger build and fewer spokes for a lighter one. But now there is such a divergence in rim technologies, well, I don't see it as being so clear cut. There are different types of spokes. Plain gauge, where the spoke is uniform width from top to bottom, or butted, where the diameter of the spoke is smaller in the middle. A plain gauge spoke will tend to be stiffer and a butted spoke a bit more flexible, therefore stronger. Rim dimensions in recent years have got wider, which in turn lets us run wider treaded tires at lower pressures, which can increase grip. Now imagine standing on a beach ball. The narrower your stance, the harder you will find it to feel stable. This is the same for our tires. Narrow rims will be more inclined to roll when loading in hard turns or bottom out on harder compressions. Now, please use some common sense here. A very wide tire won't play as nice with a very narrow rim and vice versa. You'd be really surprised how much difference a rim can make to tire profile, both at the sidewall and at the tread. Now, the big question. In regards to material, well, a good wheel is a good wheel. Both alloy and carbon have their pros and cons, but material is just one piece of the puzzle. It matters, but only as much as design, profile, and the other technologies plumbed into it. I'm not somebody that says, definitely got to be carbon or definitely got to be alloy. They both have their benefits. Most rims use a box section. This is where there are two walls of material, but there are some exceptions. Now with your alloy wheels, there will almost always be a join opposite the valve hole. Choosing the right tool for the right job is absolutely vital. Now here we have two options. Both are carbon rimmed, well, lovely wheels, but they're intended for very different things. And one is a couple of hundred grams lighter than the other. But the second one, this Enduro wheel set here, is gonna probably fare a lot better when things get rowdy. So please don't think that you're kind of getting the golden ticket by running really light wheels because it can catch you out. Use things for their intended purpose. Hookless beads are a technology that have gone hand in hand with the wider tire movement. They've moved the hook off the top of the rim where it could be a bit of a bottleneck on the tire and affect profile and move it into the well of the rim. It's still a very secure way of keeping our tires on the rims, but it's a lot more suitable for how we actually ride our mountain bikes and it has the added bonus of you are far less likely to burp your tire with a hookless rim. With tape, pretty much anything can be tubeless ready. Some rims go a little further and use a UST setup. This is where the spoke isn't put through the rim in a traditional way and the surface of the rim is uninterrupted and air tight. Now, some valves are specific to the wheel set, others are more generic. If your rim is offset, such as this FSA one, just run them with an angled washer to ensure the best seal. And there is my overview of wheels. I hope in time to be able to go into more depth on each of those topics, be it in here in the workshop or out on the trail to see the real life ramifications of certain types of setup. Now, as always guys, we really appreciate you watching. Thank you very much. Don't forget to like and subscribe and get in the comments. What's your view on some of these modern wheel technologies? As always guys, hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you later.